Well, I don't know about you guys, but I was just really blessed with the worship there, um, particularly when um, we had the little solo. I was, I was really touched. <laughs> you know, I love it in, in services when God touches us like that. I was really, really blessed by that ministry, so thanks for that. Uh, just a couple of things to, uh, to uh, make you aware of this morning. Now, a lot of people who are here this morning might not know that I've come to the, uh, the church, obviously, to pastor the church, and uh, my intentions are to pastor the church full-time at some point in the near future. But, the, you know, initially, I'm going to be joining the church on a part-time basis, so I just want to make that absolutely clear, because not everyone is probably aware that I'm, I'm going to be working for the church part-time. So rather than people come to me in six weeks and say, oh, David, what, what have you been loafing about for? You know, you've been doing nothing. You know, I'd rather, you'd rather be clear on that first of all. Now, uh, we would have liked to, uh, you know, I would have liked to have been in a position to work full-time for the church from day one, but because uh, Katie could only get a full-time job herself, that caused problems with childcare and things like that. So I'm going to be a dad looking after my little boy Levi, uh, but I'm also going to be pastor as well, which is something very, very strange. Something I never thought would happen uh, after I finished my qualification period, and uh, some, you know something that I don't particularly agree with, but circumstance um, dictates that that's the way it's going to be for the time being. So just to make that clear, um, just want to just also want to mention that uh, we've been really blessed by uh, uh, people's um, help towards us uh, at, at the start of joining the church. I just want to say. Uh, thanks to Heather for uh, providing us, us with a lovely meal the other night. We were, we were really, we, we, we just, uh, we had this massive feast, didn't we? We were like, what do we do with all this food? It's ridiculous. But it was, it was just such a blessing. And thanks for that. And thanks also to James who helped out with some electrical problems that we had left by the previous owners of the house that we bought. So I just really want to thank you guys. It's been good to get to know a few of you already. I've been on a couple of visits just getting to know you a little bit, and uh, we're hoping to get to know you as quickly as possible. So do fill out the forms, because I want to be able to contact every one of you, come and visit you and get to know you all a little bit more, and as time goes on, you know, we can really pull together and, uh, and see God do some amazing things. That's what we're here for, isn't it? That's what we expect. We want God to move uh, um, in, this, in this time, this new season in the church. Now this morning I want to begin a sermon series that's going to take us 14 weeks and everyone's like, ah, 14 weeks. It's going to be 14 weeks. Um, uh, and uh, we're going to be uh, studying a book in the Bible. Um, and, and during that time of studying uh, the book in the Bible, it might be that we take breaks from time to time to uh, talk about things that God is specifically uh, wanting to speak into in, in the church, you know, different issues. But um, we're going to do a series that's going, to, that's going to go over that period. But what I'm saying is it's not going to be 14 weeks and we'll do nothing else. You know, if God says, right, we need to take a break from this for a couple of weeks, or, and then we'll come back to it later. So we're going to do that. We're going to do a series that's going to, going to take us that long. Now, I believe that when we look at uh, whole books of the Bible, when we look at uh, the, the fullness of Scripture, it's a good thing for us. It's a good thing for us. You know, sometimes we come to church... And uh, we want to be comforted, because church is a comforting place, isn't it? We want to be comforted, and uh, also, we want to feel comfortable, because church should be a comfortable place, shouldn't it? But what about a church that challenges people? What about a church that changes people's mindset? I believe in a church like that as well, as well as a church of comfort. See, I believe that when we look at a whole book in the Bible, the Holy Spirit can speak to us and challenge us in ways that familiar passages of the Bible that we often look at, that comfort and that um, make us feel comfortable, often don't. We need to be challenged as well. So that's why I want us to look at a whole book in the Bible. You know, the thing I love about Jesus' public ministry is that he spoke about really obscure stuff in the Bible. He came to things that people had left and neglected and said, what about this and what about that? And people were like blown away because he had a full understanding of the whole of Scripture. People were challenged. People were thinking, well, actually, this religion thing that we've got ourselves involved in isn't really touching the, 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 the heart of what God wants to do in our lives and in our, in our city. And that's why his teaching was so attractive. 
And I love that about Jesus. He, he, he never neglected the, the tricky bits, the difficult bits, the hard bits that we have to look at as well. So this morning I want to begin by looking at the, uh, look, looking at the book of Amos by way of an introduction this morning. And I believe that as we go through the book of Amos, it's going to challenge us. I really do. I believe it's going to challenge us. Now, I believe that Amos, as Mike was saying earlier, lived in crazy times. I believe Amos lived in crazy, crazy times. I do. <laughs> now, where am I? Is the light's not very good in here. <laughs> Yeah. Now Amos uh, was from uh, Judah, and uh, he basically went and prophesied to ten tribes who made up Israel. Now what happened was that the kingdom of of Israel had been divided into two halves. There was there was the the there was the you know the kingdom of Judah, and there was the kingdom of um, of Israel. It had been split right down the middle. You know, like sometimes what happens when. When church is split, it had been split, there had been a division. It was a divided nation. And uh, Amos then, he, he prophesied to the tribes of Israel, the ten tribes of Israel, and he did that around about 760 AD. And according to one scholar that I was looking at, he only actually preached, or his ministry only lasted for just under two years. And I find that incredible because he, he, he does so much, uh, uh, he deals with so many different issues in, in, his, in his prophecy and talks to so many different uh, 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 people and, and groups. Uh, but he did it over a, a span of two years. Now, whether that's accurate, you know, you have to just go with what the scholars say because, you know, not, they're not always accurate. It's quite possible it might have been two years, but at the end of the day, we'll never know until we're in eternity, will we? But, you know, irrespective of that, I believe that when... Amos preached. He preached with burden. He preached with burden. He was burdened for the people. He saw the people and the nation of Israel caught up in stuff that God never intended them to be caught up in. He was burdened. He was burdened about injustice that was taking taking place in the land. He was burdened. Uh, by the great inequalities that were taking place in, in the land. He was burdened because he saw the nation surrounding uh, the nation of Israel and Israel itself in a time of great insecurity. It was in, in an insecure time that Amos was living in. He saw, he, he saw all these things going on. He also saw catastrophic natural disaster that was going to be coming to the nation. He saw a nation that had become arrogant as it had grown and it flourished off the back of international trade. He saw all these things going on. He saw uh, that uh, the wealth that had come into the nation had brought injustice and greed. He saw the rich... Uh, getting richer, amassing these huge property portfolios, hundreds and hundreds of properties. Uh, you saw their, 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 their houses were crammed with the most expensive, luxurious uh, furniture inlaid with ivory, you know, the very best stuff that you could get. And he saw that religion had just become something that was dead, a dead routine that people were, 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 were doing. They were just going through the motions. He saw that God's true presence was no longer there. And I believe that when Jesus undertook his public ministry, he saw the same stuff going on in the nation of Israel. I believe that when he went to the temple to preach, he saw that there was nothing there. Nothing there. And that's why the bulk of Jesus' public ministry was spent outside of the four walls of the temple. He went out to the people. He went out to the people because there was nothing there. There was no true presence of God. Like I say, Amos, uh, I believe, lived in, in very unstable, bizarre times. And that, as I was thinking about all that, I, uh, and all the things that were going on in, in 8th century um, BC Israel, 
when I was thinking about all those things, I couldn't help but be struck by the similarity of what's happening in our nation today. Crazy times. Everyone would agree, wouldn't they, wouldn't they that we live in crazy times. Crazy stuff going on. You know, the, the recent Eurozone crisis has caused great insecurity within our world, hasn't it? Unprecedented insecurity. Uh, and it's a global thing. It's, it's insecurity on a global scale. You know, over the last decade, we've seen countless natural disasters happen, like dominoes, one after another. The, 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 the tsunami that hit, hit, hit Asia, uh, stuff happening in Japan, Afghanistan, New Zealand, Haiti. It, it, we just lose kind of... Uh, we, we just lose kind of the, the ability to, to log it because there's so much stuff going on. And prior to our most recent recession, we've seen our nation and other nations growing in arrogant pride as we've become prosperous on the back of international trade. We've seen this, this pride that we're wealthy and that we can do anything we want because we have resources and, and money uh, uh, growing amongst our nations. You know, I was listening to an economist recently on the telly and he basically said that Britain has become like a big warehouse. That's what we are nowadays. We're a huge global warehouse where goods come in and goods go out. And he was talking about the fragility of it all, and he was talking about how um, we need to be a, a, a country that starts to make stuff again. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And I thought, this, this guy is just talking so much sense, because it's, it, we're just like this huge big warehouse. He was talking about um, all this kind of stuff, and, and I was just thinking about that, and I was thinking, who gets the wealth? Where does the wealth go? And as we see from the commodity market, the traders get richer and richer, the institutions get bigger and fatter and richer. And our wealth, like in Amos' time, has brought great inequalities within our nation. And our faith in, a, in, in God as a nation, we, we used to be a God-fearing nation, that's England, Scotland, Ireland and Wales, the whole of the UK, we used to be a God-fearing nation. And that fear of God, that devotion to God, has been replaced by faith in stuff. Faith in stuff. <coughs> and I believe that we, like Amos, are living in very crazy times. And I believe that God is speaking to us through those things. I do. I believe God's speaking. And as we'll see over the next few weeks, God stirred something in Amos. And I, I want to be part of a church where God stirs something in us because of what's going on. Yeah. I want to be stirred. We, we learn from the book that Amos, uh, was a, he was just a normal country farmer. He, was, he, was a very, he wasn't a guy from like kind of ama an, an amazing background. He was just a farmer. He looked after sheep and he harvested figs. Now, I don't know what that looks like, but um, apparently they used to slash the figs so that they could ripen, and then they would pick. So that would be they would pick them. So that would be kind of part of his job. Uh, so he used to he used to be a farmer and a, 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 a harvester of, of uh, these fruits. And I want us to be encouraged by that this morning. I want us to be encouraged by his background because. God is not looking for supermen. He isn't. God, God isn't looking for supermen to build his kingdom. And that doesn't mean that we don't become supermen and women. That doesn't mean that God doesn't make us into incredible people that, that make an incredible difference in the lives of others and bring great change and restitution and, 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 and all, all that kind of stuff. It doesn't mean that God's not going to change us. You know, I, I, I want to be changed. Do you guys, I want to be changed from one degree of glory to the next. I want to be the person that God wants me to be and stop operating as the kind of person that, that, that where, where I'm always thinking about what I could be. And I believe that's the same for all of us. God wants to do incredible things in our lives and he uses 
humble people. He looks for people who have good hearts, who have a passion for their saviour, who see injustice and, and want to speak up and say, I, that isn't right. You know, Jesus chose normal people. Sometimes they were on the radical fringes. Sometimes they were the people that were speaking up. The, the, the zealots that were kind of ostracized. They were, the, they were the, the, you know, the religious terrorists of their day. And Jesus chose them. They were just normal guys. But they had something of a burden. They had something of passion in them. God chose them because their heart was right. They, they weren't particularly right. There were things that needed straightening, up, straightening out. There were edges that needed to be taken off. But God chose them. He chose them in their raw state because their heart was right. And God's looking for a people with a heart. God's looking for a people whose heartbeat resonates with the heartbeat of Christ. That's what God's looking for in our generation. We see uh, uh, in the chapters ahead of us, because of the characteristics of this guy called Amos, God took him from the countryside to the capital to speak to leaders who should have known better. And in our time, it'd be like taking a sheep farmer from in the middle of Anglesey, somewhere like uh, Elim or somewhere like that. You know, a tiny little place called Elim. Taking someone like that and sending them to the Welsh Assembly in Cardiff and, and telling them to say, come on, sort, sort it out, get your act together. That's, what, that's, that's exactly what happened in Amos's time. And I believe that as Amos got closer and closer to the Lord, uh, God put with him, within him this passion and this fire that couldn't be put out. He began to see the craziness with the eyes of God. And sometimes we lose our focus, we don't see what's going on. We, we, we become desensitized to things that offend God because we don't see with the eyes of God. God's wanting people who see with the eyes of the living God, who see with the eyes of Christ, and, and who are broken and have a burden for what's going on. Amos was that kind of guy. And he began to see crazy things. And as we see, God spoke to him through a series of seven visions. The first, first six were about nations that surrounded Israel. The, the next one was about Israel itself. And then God, God uh, spoke to him about judgments that were going to come on the nation of Israel. And then God gave him further visions specifically for the nation of Israel. Five of them, which are recorded later on in the book. And then God gives him this vision of uh, this, 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 this kingdom that's coming and this restoration that's coming and this book finishes full of hope. It's not all about doom and gloom. You know, I love the prophets because they, it was doom, they, they spoke about issues and things that were wrong, but there was always hope. And there's hope. There's hope. We might think that God can't do that much in our town. We might think that things haven't changed and things haven't happened for so long. But I want to tell you there's hope. There's hope for this town. There's hope for each one of us in here this morning. There's hope. So let's read what verses 1 and 2. That's all we're going to do this morning. The, the rest of it comes in bigger chunks, but we're going to read verses 1 and 2. The words of Amos, one of the shepherds of Tekoa. What he saw concerning Israel two years before the earthquake, when Isaiah was king of Judah, and Jeroboam, son of Jehoash, was king of Israel. He said, the Lord roars from Zion and thunders from Jerusalem. The pastures of the shepherds dry up and the top of Carmel withers. You know, I read that initially and I thought, how do you preach on that? There's not a lot to say, is there? But when we look at scripture, we, when we dig in, we find stuff, we find nuggets in there, incredible things. And there's some incredible things coming in these two verses that we're going to look at now. The first thing that we notice within this verse, verse 1, is that Amos was from Tekoa. It was only a little place that wasn't much known about. It's a bit like Jesus coming from Nazareth, where people said nothing good comes from there, but something good came from Tekoa. Something good can come from Hollyhead. 
your life can be transformed and, and God can do amazing things in your life because he wants to bring something good from this town. Tekoa was a town situated 10 kilometers from Bethlehem, about, about uh, 20 kilometers south of Jerusalem. So Amos was kind of near the, near the center of worship in Jerusalem. But he, he went away from that land and he went, he, he went out um, and he went to the ten tribes of Israel to tell them that God wasn't happy with what was going on. And he would have been considered an outsider as he went out from his own land and his own prom province and the place where he worshipped. He would have been considered an outsider. He would have been fearful of speaking about the visions that God had put within his hand heart and within his mind. He would have been fearful because he was confronting wealthy, prosperous and powerful people. He was confronting the ruling classes from another nation. But because of what he'd seen, he felt compelled to, to go to the people, to go to the people of Israel and to tell them these messages that God was bringing that I believe that the messages that Amos brought were mercy messages. He was he was saying, look, there's a way out. If you turn back to God, God will change the situation. It'll turn things around. There were mercy messages that He was bringing. And I want to say to you all in here this morning that if we want to see God's vision for our lives, He sometimes is going to do some difficult things in our lives. He's going to ask us to go into difficult situations. He's going to ask us to do things that don't make sense. You know, John the Baptist was asked to go out into the wilderness, wear camel skin and eat locusts and wild honey. And that's just weird, isn't it? He was asked to do stuff that didn't make sense. Jesus, when he could have defended himself in, in front of Pilate, he could have got himself off the hook, kept silent because he heard the voice of God say, you keep silent now. You set your peace now. We see from this passage that God confirmed Amos' call to go and preach through the, the, these visions that he had, these powerful, powerful visions. And I, I believe they were real visions. I do, I believe they were real. I believe that, that, that like the visions that the other prophets had, the minor prophets and the major prophets, they were real visions. They were like the vision of John on Mount Patmos in prison in Revelation 1.12. Real visions. And I really believe that God still speaks through visions today. I believe that God speaks through visions today. You know, before we were asked to come and speak to the leaders here at Hollyhead, I was preaching in a church in Yeovil one week and a lady came up to, came up to me after the service, I'd never seen her before, and she said, I, I've got a vision of the church that God's going to send me to. We'd never met her before, and she said, it's a church that's surrounded by grey terraces. It, it looks like a Methodist church, an old chapel, Methodist church, but it's not a Methodist church. It's dusty. And it's full of cobwebs. <laughs> <laughs> Part of the church hasn't been used for a while. Part of it's un unused. The town that you're going to is like a town within a town. It's kind of connected to a town. It's a town connected to a larger town. There are lots of windows and it's flooded with light. It's up north. And it's going to have a flourishing youth. And uh, we took that. And we thought that this prophecy was re relating to another church that we'd been to visit a few weeks earlier. But this church that we'd been to visit, it, it didn't look like an old Methodist church. It wasn't like an old chapel. But we, we pursued that. And I went to Gordon Neal and I told him about this vision. And said, you know, I really believe that God's speaking to us. I think it might be this church. And, and uh, uh, we asked him to speak to the leaders of the church to see if we could have a chat with them and, you know, uh, uh, talk with them. Because I knew the church had become vacant. It had been vacant for about two years. I'd been offered the church uh, about a year before. But because I was looking at something else, I couldn't look at it. So we, we wanted to go back and backtrace everything that we, we looked at to see if perhaps we'd been disobedient and God was bringing us back to something that he'd offered us before. And, and, uh, and anyway, the, 
go and Neil had a chat with the guys and, and it eventually it all petered out and came to nothing. They were in talks with the, another guy uh, uh, and he eventually went to be their pastor. But Katie and I, we just left confused. We just left thinking, are we losing the plot? Are we, are we kind of, uh, are we lost it? Are we just clutching at straws? Are we just desperate? And sometimes it, it, it's like that in our world with God. Sometimes things don't make sense. They, they're, they're difficult. And then, of course, we're offered healing Hollyhead. And I remember the first time we walked to the balcony here, and Kate said, oh, it's full of cowboys this place. <laughs> <laughs> Someone needs to give this place a good clean. <laughs> and uh, Kate pointed out to me, it's surrounded by great terraces. And then with all this kind of stuff came back. Now, I want to say that prophecy like this needs to be tested. We didn't just come here willy-nilly or we've heard from God. You know, other things needed to come into, come into play for this to become a right reality, and they did. And, you know, we're just moving forward in faith now. And I want to say that all the T's aren't crossed, all the I's aren't dotted. You know, there's some, still some difficult stuff that over time I believe God's going to help us to understand. But we're here, and we've come here in obedience. So I believe in visions. I believe we've got to be careful. We, we can't be wacky about this stuff. We've got to test it. But I believe in visions. I believe that God speaks through visions. In this passage we see that there was going to be a huge earthquake. And Amos had seen it two years before it happened. Wouldn't you love to have that kind of prophetic insight? You know, just think of all the people who've lost houses and stuff through, through, during the recession. You know, if we'd seen, we'd seen what was going to happen, we could say, oh, you know, you know, you know, tighten things up, you know, cut down your spending, you know, all this kind of stuff. We could help people in different ways if we had this kind of prophetic eye. And I believe that that's why God gives us a prophetic eye. Sometimes we want a prophetic eye so that we can look great, so that we can be fantastic, so that we can be seen to be the big man of God with a vision who sees and gets everything right. But I want to tell you that when God speaks with visions like this, he wants to help people. He wants to touch normal people's lives and help them. Now, I was doing some research on this, and there's actually some, some uh, physical evidence that this earthquake actually happened. There's a town called Hazor, which is north of the Sea of Galilee, where there's archaeological evidence of an earthquake that decimated the area in the mid-8th century. And I thought that was absolutely astonishing. So we see from verse 1, and this is the main thing that I want us to get from this, that if we, as the people of God, really want to, really want to hear from him and are really keen to seek him, he's a God who speaks. If we get alone with him, he's a God who speaks. And sometimes he speaks through his word, sometimes he speaks through prophecy, sometimes he speaks through people, sometimes he speaks through visions. But I want to tell you that God wants to speak into your lives. Amen. He wants to speak into your lives and your situations. He wants to help you in everything that you face, in all the difficulties and all the, the challenges that you face. He wants to help you. I'm going to jump into verse 2 now. And in verse 2, we, we see uh, the main reason for, reason for God's anger. <laughs> These verses uh, in verse 1 and 2, they're verses of, of an angry God. You know, God gets angry. <laughs> There's a verse that says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And I believe in that verse. We've got to fear God. There's another verse that says, the fear of God is, a, the fear of man is a snare. Yeah? But the fear of, fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, yeah? And, and I really believe in those two things. We've got to stop fearing men. We've got to start fearing the living God. God was angry, you know. He was angry with the leaders of a nation who were meant to be shepherds and were meant to be helping the people. These people have been led astray as like false religious practices mingled with uh, pure Judaism, the pure law of God. And it became something that was never meant to be. Their religion had elements of uh, pagan rites and rituals which had been added into the mix. And it was no longer a pure religion, as I've said. And God had sent many prophets, you know, before Amos. Many prophets had been to Israel before Amos to tell them that, that things weren't right. But these, these leaders had just carried on. 
So Amos, under God's direction, confronts these leaders. I want to say that this was a man of immense courage. He confronts leaders in a foreign nation that he didn't know about the uh, sins that God was saying to come into the land. I find that astonishing. I find these prophets astonishing, men of real courage. And here is Amos reminding these leaders who would set up false worship centres all over Israel in, in Carmel and in uh, all these different places that the true centre for worship was the temple in Jerusalem. He reminds them that that was the central focus. And, you know, guys, we've got to come back to the central focus that our true centre of worship is the Lord Jesus Christ. When we come to church, we've got to shut everything else out and just say, God, I want to worship you. I want to come to your presence today. I want to worship you. I want to shut out the fact that other people might be watching and stuff might be going on in other people's lives and stuff that's happened this morning that stopped me from coming to a place of worship. I don't want to worship you. God's after pure worship. He's, Jesus deserves our worship, you know. This is the man who died on a cross for the sins of the world. This is the man who's taken our sin away from us and given us new life in all its fullness. We're going to worship him, friends, and we've just got to shut out all the religious stuff and start worshipping God and let the Spirit of God come down and, and just enjoy God's presence. And I want to encourage you, let's, let's be a church that worships God. You know, sometimes we want like 10 guitarists on stage and we want 50 pianos. I want to tell you that if we've got two or three people together who were just on fire for God, no instruments or anything, and they're speaking in tongues and praising God and singing and all that kind of stuff, that's worship is equally as valuable as like the most incredible stage set with all the things going on. God wants our hearts. And he had Amos's heart. He had Amos's heart. The message is that these false shepherds had, had been given to the people, had created a religion that, that was going to dry up, and that's why he says, you know, uh, uh, the pastures of the shepherds dry up, because they weren't true shepherds. What they were giving, what they were delivering was going to dry up. It was going to bring the people no good. It was going to leave the people thirsty. And Amos was saying, God is, God is going to intervene in all this. And when he does, it's going to be like a lion roaring. It's going to be like a, a thunder blast that you've never heard before. God's going to intervene. He's going to deal with all this stuff. And sometimes in our walk with Jesus, it's going to get stormy because God wants to wake us up and get us back on track. He wants to wake us up because he loves us. He's going to roar from time to time like a lion about situations and circumstances that are causing us to step into places of danger in our walk with Jesus. He's going to roar at us if our faith in him has become self-centred and, and introverted. And I think that's what happened in Israel. You know? the, the, the nation was no longer a beacon of hope to the surrounding nations. And you know, I believe that all God ever wants us to do is to stay pure, you know. He wants, he wants a pure people. He wants a people who walk closely with him. He wants people to be beacons of hope to the people around them. And we need to remember this, you know. We need to remember that our purpose is to bring the hope of the world to the lives of people that we know and come into contact with. To bring Jesus to this town and to this generation. To look outwards and to go and do what God wants us to go and do. And I believe that that's what Jesus did, as I've already said before. And as we're going to see over the next few weeks, that's what Amos, Amos did as well. He went out. He went into difficult and dangerous and challenging situations. He, he was living in crazy times, but he refused to hide behind the walls of the temple. Instead, he went out and he confronted what was going on. And I really believe that what Amos did was he threw a lifeline. He threw a lifeline out to the people. He threw a lifeline out to the leaders. And I want us to be a church that, yeah, challenges, 
But I want us to be a church that throws lifelines out. You know, like we're all on this boat together, we're just throwing lifelines out, but with all our might, in a, in, with all our strength, trying to reach people for the kingdom of God. So I just hope that's been a blessing to you this morning. Let's uh, just close in prayer. <coughs> Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you that, Lord, things that in the Old Testament are good for us, Lord. We remember, we remember this morning, it's always got to be rooted in you, Lord. And uh, Lord, as we've been worshipping you this morning, as you've touched our hearts, as you've, as you've spoken through your word, we just want to thank you, Lord God, that, Lord, you've chosen us. Your mercy has reached to us. We just want to bless you, Lord, that, Lord, you love your people. You love the church. You love each one of us in here this morning. You want us to be and to become all that we want to, you want us to be and become. And we, we just want to pray that, Lord, as we look at this book, it, it help us to focus, to redirect, to, 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 to look at Christ in a new way. We pray as we do that, our lives be challenged. We, we change stuff. But we pray more than anything else that, Lord, we will bring your light into people's darkness. Your hope into people's desperation. We pray God move in our church this year. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Yeah.